Welcome back everybody from the coffee break. I hope you enjoyed your break and we're happy to have you back on your seats for the next part of the activities. Good to see you all again. Would you all please find your seat and take your seat so we can continue. I've had a few adventures. Yeah, yeah, you've already laid on that pressure, Philip. <laughs> exactly, it's all right. Five minutes over already. Okay, we have some work on the coffee break. Welcome. Katrin, do you think we can begin? Welcome back, everybody. I'm not so sure if you could begin because I see a lot of people standing in the back still. Of course, understanding there's so much to share, but we would invite you to please take your seat, then we can continue with the next module. In fact, if you still want to share online, I was reminded to repeat hashtag Loyola 2022 Congress. Super, so welcome back to our next module which would be the module on spirituality, personal, common, and ecological conversation in our social apostolate narratives. I invite our first keynote speaker to share with us her story of conversion and link with the universal apostolic preferences, Celia Dean Drummond, director of the Laudato Si Research Institute at Campion Hall University of Oxford, an accomplished author, a researcher, as well as member of the Social Apostle Steering Committee. Celia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, is this on? Um, thank you very much for um, coming back after what sounded like a really energizing tea break. So I hope you feel sufficiently awake. But first of all, to thank. Um, Peter and, and, and the rest of the steering committee for inviting me to, to address you this afternoon. My argument is going to be quite simple. Social justice issues and ecology are intimately bound up together, so we cannot think about one without the other. The two are totally integrated, and I hope to show that it, they've also, um, to a degree at least, been integrated in my own story. So we know that the Earth system is in crisis. 
And life depends on the health of the earth. So if we don't look after the earth, life will no longer exist, both for ourselves and all the other creatures on the planet. We already had COP26 in Glasgow last year. Just in a few weeks' time, there's going to be COP15. But COP15 is about biodiversity, the Biodiversity Convention. And it's the 15th one that's met over the last, again, 15 years, mostly because of activists and others who are biologists, like E.O. Wilson, started to say that it's not enough just to have conferences of parties on climate change. We also need to look at biodiversity, because, again, climate change and biodiversity loss are intimately bound together. So if you lose one, it changes the other. So if you lose biodiversity, climate change is enhanced, and so on. But I'm going to begin, um, first of all, with uh, a, a, um, referring to Munoz's work, um, where he's talked about the cannonball of our time being climate migrants. So again, stitching together the fourth apostolic preference with the, with the first. And he argues that we need a call for a radical change not only in our lives, but also for a radical change in our world. So it's a wake-up call. We have to change both simultaneously. Think about issues such as water pollution or environmental resource depletion. They're issues of ecological devastation, but they're also social justice issues as well, impinging on the social, economic, the political levels. It's interweaving all these different systems and levels that we need to think about simultaneously. So it's an intellectually a huge challenge to work out what to do. Resource limitations, loss of fertility in the soil, drought, rises in sea levels, increases in conflicts, the depletion of resources, all these lead to climate migrations. And we're going to see more and more of these um, over the next 10 years or so. We've already seen the devastating migrations that have been happening because of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Wars about resource depletions are likely, so in other words, the probability of something like this happening again because of resource depletions or even arguments over resources um, are going to become increasingly likely. So the fourth apostolic preference, then, isn't just an add-on, an extra, that we might have the luxury to think about, but it's the fundamental place and context of all the other preferences, including the first one in spirituality. And young people, in particular, are going to feel the need to address this, this problem, but also all of us who've been working and thinking about this area for some time. It's a global a crisis, then, that includes the thinking about the loss of species, including mammalian species. 50% of, of, of uh, higher animals and mammalian species have depleted just in my lifetime. But it also affected amphibians, insects, and others. We're looking at a depleted ecology. So what we need is an ecological conversion that starts to think about the way we treat each other and the natural world simultaneously. My own particular journey to this pathway has been a meandering one. I started off as a biologist, a natural scientist, and my curiosity as a young woman was really about how the world works. I saw the in the world, the, the natural world as a sacrament God was somehow present in it for me, and that inspired me to try and understand more about it. I didn't yet know that that was an Ignatian concept, but understanding the importance, the basic importance of plant life, always struck me as being the most fundamental, because it was on the basis of that plant life that all of our lives are dependent. Plants synthesize proteins. They also trap um, a carbon, in through process known as photosynthesis. If it wasn't for plant life, we wouldn't exist. With the rise in genetically modified organisms, as I was working as a researcher in different universities in the UK, I became more aware of some of the justice issues that were at stake. 
but most of the scientists who I was working with were far more interested in getting funding from multinational companies that worrying, than worrying about the justice and the social issues. I found this incredibly frustrating. I didn't want to wait till I was a full professor uh, before I started thinking about those issues. So I, I moved then into the area of theology and ethics. It wasn't as much, that shift from science to uh, theology and ethics was, I would say, the most dramatic conversion moment of my life, far more so than moving from being a Protestant to being a Catholic. This, the question of being uh, vulnerable, out of control that uh, we've heard from Father General today was certainly part of that experience. Mm. But at the same time, I knew that that was right, the right thing to do, because it was also a call, a vocation, a call from God to, if you like, move into that area. I felt drawn into it, just as the way I felt drawn in to thinking about the natural world and trying to study its intricate parts. So what should we say then about ecological conversion? It's not a sudden um, uh, dimension that's come into Catholic social teaching with Pope Francis, but it's been part of Catholic social teaching since the uh, turn of this century. Pope John Paul II, for example, also tried to, or attempted to connect people and planet and also understood the interrelationship between our care for our planetary home and peacemaking. And peacemaking is on our minds at the moment, but we need to think about the fundamental ways in which we can secure that peace through care for one another and care for our common home. Back in, in 2002, he partnered with the ecumenical patriarch, Bartholomew I, and said this, What is required is an act of repentance on our part and a renewed attempt to view ourselves, one another and the world around us within the perspective of the divine design for creation. The problem is not simply economic and technological, it is moral and spiritual. A solution at the economic and technological level can only be found, can be found only if we undergo in the most radical way an inner change of heart which can lead to a change in lifestyle and of unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. A genuine conversion in Christ will enable us to change the way we think and act. And there are so many different elements in that which I think are relevant to what we're thinking about here. Radical, what are the roots of our sources and, and sources of our spirituality? Radical, what are the lasting changes in habits of mind and action that we want to put in place? And the first step is that of repentance. I don't think we can avoid that. And Pope John Paul II spoke of the fact that it's necessary, therefore, to stimulate and sustain the ecological conversion which over these last decades has made humanity more sensitive when facing the catastrophe towards which it is moving. Pope Francis also um, wove together ecological education and spirituality in his understanding of ecological conversion. And that's why he says that more than in ideas or concepts and, as such, I'm interested in how such a spirituality can motivate us to a more passionate concern for the protection of our world. So what is that inner spirituality that we're trying to reach? What's the interior impulse or the journey with God that we need to undertake? He believed that we've become dry inside. Instead of flourishing inside, our inner life is one of internal des deserts. So what is needed, therefore, and this is what he says, again, also in Laudato Si, is an ecological conversion whereby the effects of their encounter with Jesus Christ become evident in their relationship with the world around them. And this ne next citation is crucial for my argument today. Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential 
to the life of virtue. It is not an optional or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So it's particularly crucial then that ecological conversion flows from that life in Christ. That's the first preference. And from that, the ecological conversion becomes the vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork. It's not optional, but it's integral to what it means to be a Christian believer. And there are different stages in ecological conversion. First of all, again, as I've mentioned already, an admission of our ecological failures. We need to recognize that this is, these are mortal and not just venial sins, to use the language of Aquinas. Mortal means um, that, that which takes us away from, from God, the creator. Venial are where we still are in touch with God, the creator, but um, have committed sins which maybe we can uh, do something about. They're not as serious. But I would say that these are mortal sins because they undercut the very basis of life on which we all depend. So the first week of the exercises, then, is relevant to all the other weeks. Secondly, an active working at the community level, and many of us know what that is about, but the point is that it's about individual and community conversion simultaneously. So we're working at the structural level so uh, in such a way that we're not just doing recycling, which I would say are, are emblems of that sustainable practice, but we're looking at all aspects of our community lives and individual lives so that they, we make changes in the way we live and how we act. Finance, food, travel, resources, examining where our resources come in, coming from, from the cradle to the grave, Ecological restoration as well at the community level. So it's not just about what we're not doing, it's also about what we're proactively doing to change. And I would say that the conversion of these, um, uh, or, or the conversion of this practice into practices like ecological restoration not only gives other species new habitats, it also starts to build community and build community with others. And religious communities in particular have a special vocation and responsibility to act together in this way. Thirdly, acknowledging an attitude of gratuitousness. So recognizing the world and our own lives as a fundamental gift. And this ties in with the examine, which we will practice again every day this week. But what are we going to do in that exam now? We're going to look back and thank God for the life that we have. The earth needs to be included in that giving thanks. And, it, and also, the, the pri, just as the primary relationship between God and the believer is love, so the primary relationship between the believer and God is gratitude. Gratitude allows us to give a response to the call in a way that other uh, moral emotions do not. And then fourthly, the, uh, I'm going to now um, quote again about what Pope Francis says about ecological conversion, where he talks about the deep interconnectedness between different species, different creatures. He says, the ecological conversion entails a loving awareness that we are not disconnected from the rest of creatures, but joined in a splendid universal communion. That's his dream, if you will, that we will be joined in this universal communi communion with other, with other creatures. I think it's harder for those of, of us who've been brought up in the, in the Western world to have that sense of interconnectedness. We can learn from indigenous communities um, and those on the margins of different societies about their cultural enfolding in other creatures on this planet, like a second kind of nature. At the same time, we shouldn't romanticize those communities, but we need to listen and learn from them, not just as our recipients of charity 
or even recipients of our campaigns for justice, but as sources of insight about how we are to live. And certainly in this way, we give respect, deep respect to those of other traditions and cultures. Although agrarianism in a, in a Western context um, also to a degree um, imitates that interconnectedness, I think there are still important lessons to learn from indigenous communities about our vulnerability and our dependence on both one another and the natural world around us. We need to recognize that we are dust, dust of the earth, Adam, means dust, hummus, soil. We're soil creatures. So we should acknowledge that dependence and vulnerability then instead of working towards dominating and domineering our planet. And that gives a sense of humility. And then finally, honouring each creature as a reflection of divine love. We need to perceive creation then in a new way. And just to quote that art to see again, each creature reflects something of God and has a message to convey to us. Those messages are becoming mute because we're leading species to extinction or endangerment. I seem to be running out of time. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll just run through now. Um, our recalling question four, living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to the life of virtue. It's not an optional or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. So what does the ecological meaning of vocation mean? First of all, loving for, love for each other and the earth in unison, as I've mentioned earlier. And I'll just maybe just quote uh, one last uh, quotation from Laudato Si. In order to make society more human, more worthy of the human person, love in social life, political, economic and cultural, must be given renewed value, becoming the constant and highest norm for all activity. In this framework, along the, with the importance of little everyday gestures, Social love moves us to devise larger strategies to halt environmental degradation and cult encourage a culture of care which permeates all of society. So the important point here is that it's an interweaving of political, economic and cultural care in new forms of strategic thinking. And that, uh, in addition, although he says that some are called to engage directly in political life. We're all called to get engaged indirectly as a way of creating a new kind of social fabric. And that social fabric, again, is important because when we feel that, this is to quote Pope Francis again, when we feel that God is calling us to intervene with these others in social dynamics, we should recognize that this too is part of our spirituality, which is an exercise of charity and as such, matures and sanctifies us. And then um, just to touch on the uh, developing awe and wonder, um, the discovery of God in all things also leads Pope Francis to, to, uh, to suggest what he calls mystical meaning in a leaf, in a mountain trail, in a dew dot drop, in a poor person's face just as we heard about um, encountering God in the lives of prisoners, we can also encounter, encounter God in the created world. And finally, I'm just going to wrap up now. I know I've only got probably half a minute left. One. One minute left. <laughs> okay, um, I'll do my best. I began with the environmental crisis, with the plight of climate and environmental refugees as the cannonball of our time. I've argued that ecology shouldn't be split off from human and ecological and justice issues. They're interwoven. Have we felt the world's pain, the lament of all creatures? The first step is acknowledging our implication in these failures. And Pope Francis has, called, has asked us to 
press for ecological conversion as part of our spiritual journey for, for every Christian. I have not arrived myself, and I have to admit that after 30 years of reflecting on this topic, I haven't even begun to change in the way that's necessary at a deep level. At the same time, we all struggle and are on the journey together. We need to work out for ourselves with fear and trembling, as it says in Philippians 2.12. And the enormity of the task and the limit, our own human limitations relies on the grace of God to enable us to think and act differently. So the call then is ecological conversion. And I would say that we're at the stage in our planetary history where we do not have a choice. To be faithful to God as the author of life, we need to care for this and future generations. But the task is not impossible. And just as the final word now, I'm going to quote Laudato Si, the final text that he uses, which is this. In the meantime, we come together to take charge of this home which has been entrusted to us, knowing that all the good which exists here will be taken up into the heavenly feast. In union with all creatures, we journey through this land seeking God. For if the world has a beginning and it is, if it has been created, we must inquire who gave it this beginning and who was its creator. Let us sing as we go. May our struggles and concern for this planet never take away the joy of our hope. Thank you so much for being patient and listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celia. Our next keynote speaker is Catherine Camilleri, a long-time member and director. We have some interference, I think. A long-time member and director of GRS Malta, recipient of awards and recognition for her work with, among others, people fleeing from the Mediterranean Sea. So, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for, thank you. And thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to be here with you this afternoon. It's a privilege. Um, I must admit that when I was asked to speak in this Congress, I initially assumed that I was going to be asked to talk about my work, which is what people usually ask me to talk about. When I realized I was supposed to talk about conversion, my conversion, I got a little bit of a fright. I think primarily because I'm very much aware that my conversion is very much a work in progress. Um, also, unlike many people, many great saints like St. Paul or St. Ignatius, or even John Dardis, <laughs> who maybe will become a great saint, <laughs> I can't really pinpoint uh, a specific moment or specific place where, when this conversion, this journey began. In Fratelli Tutti, when speaking about solidarity, um, Pope Francis talks about the important role of family in creating a culture of solidarity. And he says this, I think that this reflection about family being the place where we start to learn that we're responsible for the fra fragility of others is it really resonates with my personal experience because I was born into a family where I think I can say that the predominant narrative was that we're not only responsible for ourselves or even for our family, but we're responsible also for others. And growing up, my sisters and I heard numerous stories about family members, you know, who reached out and helped other people. And, this picture here, which used to hang in my grandmother's um, kitchen, was actually the focus of one of these stories. This building here is a, a building called uh, St. Ignatius Villa, <laughs> surprisingly. It has an interesting history, actually, because it was originally built by uh, an English businessman. 
And at a certain point, this building I passed on to the Jesuits, who opened there their first boarding school in Malta. The, the, bo the boarding school was open between 1877 and 19, uh, 1907, which is then when they opened St. Aloysius College in Bricricara. Right after that, this, bu this building was used to house a group of Russian refugees who fled the war in their country. And one of the refugees who was hosted in this house painted this picture. He was an, art architect, his, uh, an artist, artist, sorry, and he gave it to my great-grandfather as a thank you for reaching out and, and helping. Um, I, I must admit, today, when I look back, seeing that many of the people in this building were Russian nobility, in fact, I question whether African refugees arriving on a boat would have got the same treatment. But from my perspective as a child, I never questioned. And the message was really clear. They helped, and that is what we must do. So, and I have to say that the message wasn't only passed through stories, it was actually, it was passed also through lived experience. I, I mean, I was literally, we were literally surrounded by people who were far from perfect, but who really went out of their way to help others, who clearly cared profoundly. And people for whom family wasn't just blood relations. So I think this witness of people who made a, a faith-based choice to live lives of solidarity, in a way, prepared the ground for me then to, to try to find a way, when I was starting out as a lawyer, to, to try to find a way to, to match, so to speak, my, my life, my work, with my fate. When I started out at JRS in 1999, a long time ago, my, my focus was mostly on doing. I wanted to make a difference. Then and now, I was really drawn by the JRS mission and this call to be a witness to God's love through accompaniment. The, oops, this is the, this um, quote is from the JRS Charter, which calls us to be an effective sign of God's love and reconciliation through our accompaniment of refugees. And this commitment to accompaniment, which is central to JRS, took me to a number of horrible places, I must say, many of which actually very close to where I live, but so different from the life that till then I had lived. Looking back, I think what marked me mostly, most profoundly, was the experience of accompany, accompanying refugees in detention. This picture here, which is part of a mural which stand, hangs on the wall in the JRS office, was painted by refugees, asylum seekers, and it, it, it traces their journey from their home country to, at the end here, in this um, kind of white section, which is the last part of the mural, hopefully the life, um, uh, life to the full, so to speak, yes. Um, this gray portion here depict, depicts their experience in detention. And it kind of gives us a sense of how they experienced this time in detention. Over the years, many describe this time as a time of darkness and uncertainty, which changed them profoundly. One man from Ghana, he wrote this, that detention is the dark side of the world, the starvation of the soul. And yet another man told me, you know, this detention, it's so hard. You, re you don't recognize the person you have become. And I must admit that the first time that I walked into a detention center, I was totally overwhelmed, and I couldn't begin to understand how 
we could actually make a difference. The needs, the tension were huge, you know, people had literally nothing. They lacked everything from clothes and un underwear to effective legal remedies and everything in between. And our resources, as always, were very limited. It was also very clear to me that detention and the situation in detention wasn't only because of a lack of resources or because it was an, because it was an emergency, no. It was a deliberate choice which was made to, on one hand, to appease the electorate, but on the other hand, to, yes, inflict su suffer suffering so people don't carry on coming. And so, walking into this place, the thought of witnessing to God's love, reading the words of Father Mark Raper, who at the time was the director of JRS, um, that our presence can be a sign and it can be a way of eliciting hope, made me think, but how? You know, how can you elicit hope in a place where people are routinely dehumanized? Walking there for a few, uh, and spending a few hours, I feel hopeless. I, f I feel d despair. Imagine what it must be like to be in there. But what I realized over time is that although it was very dark, it wasn't just a, pain, a place of sadness, pain, and hopelessness. In detention, I met huge stores of, of strength, of faith, of resi resilience, and of hope. And I was I never failed, I can say, to be inspired by the way in which people in detention supported and protected each other and how they managed to coexist in such terrible circumstances. And that in spite of all of this, they kept hope and supported and encouraged those who were beginning to lo lose it. What I realized was that it wasn't me or JRS who was bringing J Jesus into the tension. He was already there. As he said, he would be, in fact. I just had to open my eyes, which for me, I must admit, is far more difficult than it sounds. These pictures, which for me are very meaningful, hang on the wall of my, uh, my living room. And they're there, to remind me, to remind me of these important truths, this important lesson. First of all, that God is found everywhere, even in the most unexpected places, in a stable, in a detention center, in exile. And second, that history has shown us that although God is always there, few people are able to recognize his presence in the world and in, his li and in their lives. I have to say that to live a truly reflective life, which is attuned to the wor workings of the spirit, is for me far, f very far from easy. And often, like the, the, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, which who are in the bottom picture, I'm taken up by what's happening around me, by the things that are shaping and shaking my world. My client, who's about to be deported, Family concerns, reporting deadlines, funding shortages, the impact of the latest policy, the war of Ukraine in Ukraine, the post visit next weekend. The list of things that demand my attention somehow is always changing, but never ending. And as one of the martyrs, if I can say, of the world, my, ten my tendency is very much to get lost in my busyness. You know, I focus on what I have to do, always, of course, to me, very important and very urgent, and so I can't possibly have fine time to sit with Jesus. My, my, and so the result is that my gaze becomes totally earthbound, and I fail to, re to recognize Jesus walking by my side and speaking into my life. And so it always impresses me how my work is at once 
a place where I encounter Jesus, and at the same time, the place where it is easiest for me to lose sight of him. I have to say that working in a system that is chronically under-resourced, both as an organization, but also within a system that is, I would say, not only under-resourced, but also characterized by systemic violence, and it's it's seemingly designed to impl inflict pain, it's not, it's not easy. For the past two years, I must say, things were particularly bad. So bad, it often failed that, felt that we were like the disciples in this boat, which de depicts the, the, sto the story of when Jesus calmed the storm. It hangs this in, in, in the JRS office. Um, During this time, we, we saw many of the, 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 I would say, small positive developments that we had really worked hard for, um, literally being, let's say, rolled back. The government, in response to the increase in the number of asylum seekers coming from, from Libya, uh, devised ways of cooperation with the Libyan government to push people back and to stem the flow. At the same time, uh, the government enacted laws uh, which defined some asylum seekers as undeserving and put in place a, sy a system which prioritized their exclusion and return, which obviously undermined the integrity of the asylum procedure and led to a lot of homelessness, poverty, because pe people who were excluded couldn't access ba basic services. Detention, which after some policy changes in 2015 had decreased, made a comeback. Our access to detention, which for us was so important to be able to work, was, was curtailed. Now we can only go in to provide uh, individual asylum, uh, 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 legal assistance. And as always, in spite of the problems with the, with the system, it's always refugees and asylum seekers who are blamed for the situation and for their, their predicament and they are harshly punished when they protest or when they don't abide by rules which are unjust and in some cases unlawful. Which is of course not to say that there are no individual acts of kindness or hospitality, of course there are and we've witnessed many of these. However, they're not enough to ensure that people can go beyond as existing to living with dignity. For that, we need a, 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 sorry, a cultural and systemic change, a change of mind and heart. So stuck on the boat in this storm where we feel the wind and the waves coming at us from everywhere, and if ever you have experienced it, it's quite awful. Even on a big boat, imagine on a small one, like many people cross from Libya. Um, it's very, very difficult not to question, and it's, and it's also difficult not to succumb to, to doubt, and also sometimes to fear and hopelessness. It's also difficult to continue to provide services in this environment. If you're working in a, in a climate where asylum seekers have no access to anything, or, have, or let, let me just say, have access to very little, okay, it's difficult to provide meaningful services. So for us, meeting young people, because most of the people who come to Malta to seek asylum are young men and women, who are dreaming for a, of a better future, looking forward to be, to be able to create the conditions to achieve it, to put, use Pope Francis's phrase, it's very painful because it brings you face to face with the fact that often we are powerless to help them. Which takes me to my last picture. This picture hangs in the JRS office. It was given to us by a refugee. He didn't paint it, he didn't draw it. In fact, someone else did, and he kind of amended it to suit his purposes, which was to say thank you, which is nice. So he added DRS on top of that door, and he says thanks in the corner. Um, this picture, for me, is very meaningful 
because it helps me to understand the difference between what we offer refugees and what they are see seeking. When I say we, I mean Europe, our countries, our communities. which we, as individuals, me and you, we are a part of. For a long time, I believed, I was a bit naive, I think, I, I believed that because I worked with JRS, because I was so angry and so hurt about the way in which they were treated, that I was in some way exempted of responsibility for the awful way in which my country treats migrants. But today, I've come to understand that it's not so simple because I, too, am an integral part of this community, this community which, in some ways, idolizes wealth, this community which is built on connections. We're an island, very small. Everyone kind of knows everyone or knows someone who knows someone. I'm part of this community which is built on these connections which serve to pri privilege those who belong and exclude those who don't. And I, myself, have benefited from these connections I'm part of this community that built its economy on the availability of low-paid mi migrant labor, and so on. Of course, there's a lot of good within both individuals and within institutions. However, it's clear that everywhere it co coexists with evil. And more and more, I realize that the, the line that separates evil and go or bad from good, it's not outside of me. It runs through my heart as well. So in this reality, a reality where refugees are treated as less worthy, less important, less human, and their access is li limited to everything, th th for us, the temptation is to lower our expectations. So we allow the limitations which are set by the circumstances, by the power, the, sorry, <laughs> sorry, the, by, by policies, by laws, by the powers that be, okay, to shape our vision and our services, rather than the gospel. And it's a temptation that is insidious. It, it, it creeps in without us noticing. And we fall into this temptation not because we don't believe that refugees deserve more, of course we do, but, we, but because accepting the limits of what is possible in some way allows us to work. And it also helps us to deal with the, the very real discouragement that we're able to provide so little in practice. One of my colleagues noted how when we're faced with people who, in general, lack the most basic things, who don't have shelter, don't have work, when we meet people who do have a house, who do have work, the tendency is to think, oh, but you're okay, even if they're living in, with friends, or if they Working, they're working on a job which just pays minimum wage, and so it's barely enough to pay rent and living expenses. They're virtually living in, pov in poverty. But because there are so many people who have nothing, the first reaction is to say, oh, then you sh you're okay. Without wanting, we start to accept that this is the way that things are, that this is as far as we and they can go. But while this approach might be acceptable for a social worker in a maybe government agency, it's not acceptable for us as, follow as follow followers of Jesus. Reflecting on this, and I will close with this, what comes to mind is the meditation on the two standards, with apologies to Saint Ignatius, because I don't think he intended it to be used like this, but a bit, a bit liberal <laughs> then. But I think if we are fighting this battle under the standard of Christ, who came to bring life to the full for everyone, for me 
and for everyone else, then for me, we must own this vision for humanity. We cannot be content with saying, no, you're okay if, if, you, can, if you can survive. It also should affect the weapons we use and the way we fight the battle, which I have to tell you is really challenging, especially if you're working in a context where positions are entrenched and pol polarized. And, and ultimately, we're, we're advocating, we're fighting about issues, decisions, actions, which we can see are hurting people. They're issues that we feel very strongly about, that make we get angry about. We're, we're angry, sad, we're, we're enraged sometimes. So it's very difficult when you're advocating on these issues not to let your feelings color your perception of and your approach to the people taking these decisions. Because if we start to see people as all bad, we won't listen and we won't understand ever. And in some way, the, div the divide between us and between our positions gets ever greater. And surely this will not allow us, will not help us to renew, to quote Pope Francis, our troubled society. Last but not least, my last minute, it must influence our alliances. And here I would just say, although it might seem obvious, that our alliances must include truly mutual relationships with refugees in the work. Nobody I know who works with NGOs would contradict this. But I question how many of our alliances, our, our, our working relationships with refugees are truly mutual and truly equal. Finally, I had a quote from Pope Francis, which I think puts it very nicely in fact. Sometimes the impulse to serve others prevents us from seeing their real riches. If we really want to promote those whom we assist, we must involve them and make them agents in their own redemption, which is a tall order, but it's our calling. And it's a calling that requires faithfulness, faith, and hope. I want to end with a quote from Brian Stevenson. He's an American lawyer who works in, um, with people who are condemned to death. And it's from his book, Just Mercy. And he's talking about his work. He says, you know, we want many things, but really there's one thing that we need, and that's hope. The kind of hope that creates a willingness to position oneself in a hopeless place and be a witness that allows one to believe in a better future, even in the, in the face, face of abusive power. That kind of hope makes one strong. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Indeed, we have received two wonderful witnesses among us to share their story of conversion. Thank you both very much. I would propose a, a few seconds of silence and maybe just stretch a little bit so that this, what we have received, can be cherished as a wonderful treasure that has been given to us. And then we'll pass the floor onwards. A few moments just for us to go deeper with what we have just received. So are we getting any closer to our own conversion as a part of our spirituality, as a part of our calling, as a part of our vocation? Dr. Austin Everay is an author, journalist, and a fellow in contemporary church history at Campion Hall University of Oxford, as well as coordinator of The Road to a Synodal Church, project based at Campion Hall. 
Austin's most recent book is a conversation with Pope Francis, a book called Let Us Dream. And I think we have started our dreams already today and we will be still dreaming. And you, Austin, will lead us into this path to a better future. Austin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. And thank you for the, <clears throat> for the silence because I wanted to begin by honoring those two tremendous um, presentations. It's lovely to be with you. I'm very aware that um, I and Celia too have a natural advantage in being native English speakers, and you are not, and I speak other languages, and I know how tiring it is to have to concentrate uh, when listening to a presentation in another language. You have to work twice as hard. So um, I just <laughs> want to acknowledge that. Thank you for letting us speak uh, in our language. Also, um, I, I tend to go naturally quite fast, and if you want me to slow down, just do that, and I will try to do that. Um, Peter asked me to share some insights into Pope Francis's discernment of the signs of these times in which we are living, what we might call the post-COVID world, the post-pandemic world, in the light particularly of two encyclicals which you know very well, Fratelli Tutti and Laudato Si, and to respond to three questions, see Judge Act questions. Where are we? So a contemplate question. What are the challenges we face? The discern question. And what opportunities does this moment present? What we might call the propose section. Um, now, I know that these two encyclicals are very well known to you, um, but I do have to accept the shocking possibility that some of you may not know the book Let Us Dream, which I did with Pope Francis uh, which came out at the end of 2020. Um, but don't worry, I've brought some copies <laughs> and I've left them uh, at the back. Um, and I want to talk, uh, I will refer to Let Us Dream, but rather than quote much from the encyclicals, which you know very well, I want to refer to two texts which are in turn referred to in the encyclicals. Because it's my conviction that when Pope Francis puts such references in, in his text, he's saying to us, eh, have a look, develop your thinking, have a look at this stuff. And so I'm assuming that they are significant. And indeed, when I've gone into them, I've discovered that they are. Both of them date from the 1950s, and both were influential on Jorge Mario Bergoglio, but what's interesting is that both also have a prophetic power that makes them surprisingly relevant to this moment we are living. The first is, of course, by Romano Guardini, the German priest theologian. And the text is, oh my, I don't speak German, but das, das Ende der Nezoit, no? The End of the Modern World in English, El Ocaso del Mundo Moderno in Spanish. And the essay which followed it, which is called Power and Responsibility, so it's referred to, as you know, more than once in Laudato Si, and it provides the powerful concept, which is referred to more than once, of the technocratic paradigm, which Francis uses to describe the way in which being in thrall to technology has changed our mindset. So Guardini's core idea, and it's a fascinating book, it's a difficult book, but it's a fascinating book, uh, that as he describes how the world, as the world ceases to be God's creation in our mind, it comes to be able to be possessed and plundered. Uh, uh, this is the mentality we develop. But what's interesting is that he sees there's a paradox in the rationality that underpins this shift, sorry, the autonomous rationality. And the paradox is this, that our bid for more power would make us, in turn, more powerless. So by, by using power, we come to become more powerless. Or to put it another way, the paradox of the drive to become richer and more productive, in fact, we discover we are poorer and less productive, which is the story, of course, of modern agriculture, is it not? The use of fertilizers and ever more productive methods has resulted in the ground becoming less and less fertile. So we have a crisis in agriculture, or indeed the story of climate change. Now, it's good to keep in mind yesterday's gospel parable of the prodigal son. You know, the father's estate as a very productive place uh, where the servants are well cared for. But to the younger son, 
it's boring and uninteresting. He wants, he's ambitious. Uh, so he leaves it and he has, as you know, he extracts capital from the farm, effectively, uh, and yet ends up poor and alone. You know the story very well. And he ends up poor and alone, and it's at that moment that he has a different consciousness, and he dares to believe in the possibility of returning to the farm that he spurned, and dares to believe in the possibility that he will be received. So um, I, I only ask you to keep that in mind because this is, we are talking here about conversion, and it seems to me that Guardini's story of power and the, the growing awareness today that of the powerlessness and the desire for a different way of being seem to me very pertinent. But the other reason I, wanna, I want to cite Guardini is that, and the importance for Francis, is that Guardini predicts with remarkable clarity today's drama in which family, people, tribe, church, nation, whatever the entity is, f are falling apart in the face of the technocratic paradigm. So we have increasingly the society described by Zygmunt Bauman, memorably as the liquid society. A time, of course, of mass displacement, mass migrations, social breakdown, the collapse of grand narratives, fluidity taking over from stability, all that you know very well. But Guardini names it brilliantly. The second text is referred to just once in Fratelli Tutti, so it's more hidden than Guardini's text in Laudato Si, and it appears in a footnote to paragraph 102 at the beginning of chapter 3, where Francis says he's been inspired by an essay by the French Protestant theologian Paul Ricoeur, who is, Ricoeur is reflecting on the Good Samaritan parable, as of course Francis does in chapter 2. Now that essay is called Le Socius et le Prochain, which in the English text is translated as the associate and the neighbor, el socio y el vecino in Spanish. Now, Ricoeur, it's a very interesting essay, but I, I don't need to go into it a lot, but the idea is fairly straightforward as Francis uses it. That when, when we move from having a neighbor to becoming, making ourselves a neighbor, we're moving out from our social role, our function, that's the associate, yeah, and it is our capacity to embrace the other as a fellow human being, uh, a bit like the family, actually, that Katrine grew up in, you know, to understand that the family is bigger than our own tribe. Then that involves a kind of self-transcendence. So uh, the Good Samaritan, of course, is the drama of a parable in which two people are unable to do this, the priest and the Levite, because they are trapped in their social roles, they are incapable of self-transcendence. In Letters Dream, Francis says that they are trying to preserve their own place, their roles, their status quo, faced with a crisis that tests them. So we have here the idea that there is a crisis, the man at the side of the road who is beaten is a crisis, and then faced with that crisis, we have these two different response, one in which we retreat into our own identity, the other, the despised foreigner, the Samaritan, is capable of transcending himself, helping the wounded man, and so creating a different future, of course, for himself. Francis, reflecting on Ricoeur in Fratelli Tutti, Francis notes that only those who are capable only of being associates create closed worlds, frameworks within which there is little or mo no room for those who are not part of their group. So both in, in Ricoeur, in Fratelli Tutti, we have essentially the challenge, don't we, of Matthew 25, whether we are capable of recognizing ourselves in the other. As Francis puts it beautifully in Let Us Dream, uh, the drama or the question is not so much feeding the poor, clothing the naked, and so on, but rather recognizing that the poor, the naked, the sick, the prisoners, and the homeless have the dignity to sit at our table, to feel at home among us, to feel part of a family. This is the sign that the kingdom of heaven is in our midst. Okay? Am I going too fast? Okay. So where are we? With these two texts in mind, where does Francis see where we are? 
Again, I don't need to say this in much detail because it's familiar to you from chapter one of Laudato Si and chapter one of Fratelli Tutti, Laudato Si, what is happening to our common home, a very vivid and powerful description of the impact of the technocratic paradigm, the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor. And in Fratelli Tutti, dark clouds over a closed world, closed, a world that has retreated into itself. It's a very somber view. So what he sees is the breakdown of human belonging, just as Guardini foresaw, faced with the technocratic paradigm of globalization, and then the instrumentalization of the anguish that is produced by this, the instrumentalization by forces of national populism and other forces which are seeking to exploit that anguish for political gain. If you look at his speeches to the, to the diplomats that he gives every year in January, uh, then you see this very, very uh, dark view that Francis is expressing at the beginning of each year. You go from sort of 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, they get more and more somber, this view of what's happening. The, uh, um, the rise of various kinds of fundamentalism and the way that, for example, Islamic terrorism and national populism feed off each other in a mimetic mutual dependence, you know, producing. And then, of course, the breakdown of civility, the breakdown of, uh, of dialogue, which he describes so powerfully in Fratelli Tutti, the incapacity for civility. All this is very, very stark. And it reminds him, as he says, of the 1930s. And by the way, since he said all this, we now have an invasion uh, by a man who illustrates, again, the 1930s extremely well. So behind these developments, he sees, Francis sees, what Guardini foresaw, the breakdown, the breakup of these networks of belonging, the mass migrations. But the most important thing, perhaps, to understand is that uh, the, 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 on, we have the reality of this kind of society driven by the libido dominandi, yeah? and uh, producing this terrible suffering and anguish. And also understanding what Guardini foresaw about the, the role of the church in all of this. Guardini predicted very accurately that the church would be increasingly expelled from law and from culture. It would be dethroned and disempowered. And that two things would then happen. Many people would learn to live honestly without religion. And on the other hand, Christianity would become more convincing because it would be able to demonstrate, to perform the message of the gospel, which is the one of gratuity and humility that we've heard about. And this was essentially the diagnosis of the Latin American bishops in 2007 at Aparecida, which, as you know, was a formative experience for Francis. Uh, there was a diagnosis there that, as a result of all these changes, there was a breakdown in the bonds of belonging, belonging to God, belonging to creation, and belonging to our fellow creatures. And, of course, in this pontificate, the three perhaps most, ex most significant teachings are aimed at regenerating those three relationships, Evangelii Gaudium, our relationship with God, I would also say Gaudete et Exultate, our relationship with creation, Laudato Si, and our relationship with our fellow human creatures in Fratelli Tutti. So more than once, Francis has alluded to this, to this trend, this breakdown. And in January 2018, in Chile, he put it very startlingly. He said, without the us of a people, a family, and a nation, life will be not only increasingly fragmented, but also more conflictual and violent. So non-belonging, producing anguish, insecurity, vulnerability, a sense of powerlessness, a sense of being left behind. And in richer countries, this anguish expressed in the form of a resentment, a kind of ressentiment, sounds better in French, a resentment against perceived elites, a resentment which in Letters Dream, Francis calls brilliantly the isolated conscience. So this feeling that of being disinherited and you're angry. And you can see this in the 
rad trads in the Catholic Church. You can see this in the anti-vax movement, all those conspiracy theories about globalism and so on, people refusing to believe the news. Um, uh, this is, I think, a really good example of what Ricoeur was describing as this retreat into self, a clinging to identity, the rejection of the neighbor in favor of the associate, and so on. And of course, in Putin's invasion of Ukraine, we have the extreme demonstration of all these trends coming together, because Putin is driven by this deep sense of resentment and inferiority. Uh, and of course, the deployment of raw power, the belief that through power we can achieve our aims, a complete indifference to life, and so on. All this is very apocalyptic, but I want to tell you now a story. On the way here, I took my normal, there's a driver who always drives me to the airport called Victor, and Victor is from Ukraine, and Victor was just back from delivering supplies to Ukraine for the army and for people there, taking uh, things that he had been given by the local community, money he had raised, and of course we had a whole hour to talk about his experiences, and it was fascinating, and he spoke about how his daughter is still waiting after three weeks uh, to have her visa processed to come to the UK, even though the government has said, sure, Ukrainians can come. Um, but then the conversation got quite deep when he spoke to me. He said, well, so what does Pope Francis say about this? This happens to me quite a lot in taxis <laughs> when, I, when I admit what I do. Um, but he was talking about yeah, the evil of Putin, the suffering of Mariupol. What does Pope Francis say about this? And I said, well, I think Pope Francis would say that God works in response to evil in two ways. Through revealing, through the spirit of truth, exposing the reality so that we can see it for what it is. And secondly, in moving our hearts to respond concretely uh, in love and solidarity in all sorts of different ways. And this had an effect on Victor because he said, you know, it is amazing what's happened. And he started to tell me the stories of people offering their homes, people offering jobs to his family, the amazing outpouring of love and support that he has received. He's been in the local paper and so on. And what's very amusing is he says, of course, people are very angry with the government because the government is, is, is delaying giving visas to Ukrainians. And this is funny because if you've lived through the Brexit drama where the government's all about take back control of the borders, thinking this is what people want, <laughs> now they find people saying, no, 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 we want Ukrainians to come in. Why aren't they coming in faster? But I think all of this illustrates something that Ricoeur says in his essay, that it becomes easier to believe that we are all sons and daughters of a loving God during what he calls failures of the social realm, such as wars or great historical disasters. Only then, socially stripped, he says, do we perceive the depth of human relations? Now, Francis, I reminded Pope Francis of what he had said in Chile when we were doing Let Us Dream. And I said, shall I put that in? Something like that. Is that what you think? And he said, yes, but uh, he said, I need to add in something. We are not there yet. So remember, the quote was, without the us of a people, a family, and a nation, Life will become increasingly fragmented and conflictual and violent. But then he said, no, we are not there yet. This crisis has called forth the sense that we need each other, that the people still exists. And then he goes on in the book. Now is the time for a new humanism that can harness this eruption of fraternity to put an end to the globalization of indifference and the hyperinflation of the individual. So what's interesting, and really, I mean, Let Us Dream is a kind of meditation on that. What's interesting is that Fratelli Tutti was written before COVID, even though it came out after it. It was drafted beforehand. And I think, let, I think uh, Fratelli Tutti, that first chapter, reflects Francis before the pandemic. But actually, in the pandemic, he saw something happening. And he says it in the Statio Orbis in the square exactly two years ago, which you remember very well when he says, in the face of so much suffering, we experience the priestly prayer of Jesus that they may all be one. And he describes in that Statio Orbis how there is this unveiling of our true fraternity, that we are all, in fact, a people. So one might call this, if I to say, what is the discernment for Francis of this moment? 
I would call it, it is the hour of the people. That he puts great faith in these signs that appear in, from below. He has very little faith, I think, in institutions and in leaders at the moment. But faith that the spirit is moving in the people. And that among the, one of the signs, and he talks about it a lot in Letter Stream, is this new consciousness of ecological devastation. The new consciousness of abuse of power in all realms, you know, sexual exploitation, abuse of conscience, and so on. And we see it signs in what's happening even in the response to Ukraine, the sense that there's a coming together to defend something that is perceived to be threatened. So if the spirit works to restore our consciousness of being a people, the bad spirit works the opposite way through the isolated conscience. And some of the best pages in Let Us Dream, I think, give us an understanding of the thing that we're often troubled by in groups like this. How do we deal with the anti-vaxxers, the, 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 the national populists, the xenophobes, the people who... And I think we do need to understand that. And I would just say that that's a challenge, I think, to all of us. How do we dialogue with that? Because it's real and it's prevalent and it's widespread. Another way of expressing the isolated conscience is the beleaguered self. El ser asediado in Spanish, or el ser abroquelado, the armored self. So almost as if you interpret every, everything as an aggression against yourself. What's going on there? Francis says in Let Us Dream, he uses the, the uh, meditation and the spiritual exercises on the cosa adquisita, you know, where you, where, some, where you don't want to let go of something. So you cling on to it, and then you, you, you seek to justify it. So he's saying behind this attitude is, of withdrawal and retreat is a fear of losing something. Privilege, power, status, security, whatever it is. But my simple thing I want to share with you about this is perhaps it is worth thinking about how we can help create places of dialogue where people are able uh, to reveal that thing that they are clinging on to, the thing that they fear to lose so that we can show them <laughs> that it's an irrational fear or they have more to gain uh, by losing it. So I think for the task for Francis now, the task for the church is how to receive the prodigal son. How do we receive the people who have awoken to the technocratic paradigm, what is happening to the earth, to abuse of power? How do we receive those people who are looking for something else? How do we offer that alternative to them? So Francis says that we need to rediscover constantly the experience of faith as an experience, as an experience of encounter with the mercy of God, because all experience of God is an experience of mercy. So if for Guardini the drama of our time is the mindset of power, yeah, how do we present as the church another kind of model of power as service, of gratuity, of humility? And this is particularly important, I think, for young people who are often the most sensible uh, because they have experienced most directly the dehumanizing effect of the technocratic paradigm. They've experienced often in their own uh, experience uh, institutions that exclude, that are closed, that are self-referential. So part of Francis's response is, of course, to, as he said in 2015, that he believes that God is asking the church to become synodal, that this is the great challenge for the church to become wholly synodal. And in this current synod on synodality, which is the first baby step towards this, which begins in the local church, we have a powerful moment in which the church is taking on for the first time the structures and the form of the church imagined by Lumen Gentium when it speaks about the church as the people of God on whom the spirit of, the, of God has been poured out. So the, 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 the idea here is very important, that if the spirit of God has been poured out on all of us, then we need to get together to mutually listen to see what the spirit is saying to us. And what is increasingly becoming clear to Francis, and I think this is why he has pressed the pedal on synodality, is that a missionary and pastoral conversion 
depends on a synodal conversion of the church in which we learn as missionary disciples to act together in cooperation, collaboration, and co-responsibility, words, of course, used by Father General just early. So a church of mutual listening, a church attentive to the periphery that allows those voices to be heard inside the center so that the periphery moves to the center to help the center become what it is called to be. A synodal church, he said at the beginning of the synod last October, will require changing certain overly vertical, distorted, and partial visions of the church, the priestly ministry, the role of the laity, ecclesial responsibilities, roles of governance, and so forth. It's quite a long list. <laughs> but what's fascinating is to see the new apostolic constitution of the Vatican, of the Curia, Predicate Evangelium, speak precisely about lay people, women, in governance in the church. And Father Gianfranco Ghirlanda, the canon lawyer, Jesuit canon lawyer, commenting on the apostolic constitution, said it very clearly that um, governance in the church flows not from orders, but from canonical mission. So here we have the vision of a church in which the charism is poured out. From the charism, we get the, we get the mission, and it is the mission that allows us to occupy those positions of leadership. So a synodal church helps us to become a church of neighbors rather than associates. It helps us to become a church of humble service rather than of power, and therefore to perform the gospel at the very moment that our world demands to see this in us. So to sum up, the crises of our time produced by the technocratic paradigm are producing two contrary movements. On the one hand, a clinging to a world of associates and the isolated conscience and so on. On the other hand, the birth of a new consciousness of universal fraternity and of neighbor. And our ministry, I should say your ministry and your mission take place against the backdrop of these two contrary forces. Secondly, that the opportunity of this time is to transform our church, our way of being, our way of proceeding, so that it models a Samaritan church that becomes the sign of the neighbor to the prodigal son who has seen and experienced the technocratic paradigm at first hand and dares to hope of an alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Austin. That was, that was enriching. Um, I would invite all of you to take one or two minutes for thinking about all the things we heard, to share with your partner, with your neighbor, as we, as we did in the morning. And then we would.